Before we dive into bloodlines, let's talk about the picture most of us carry in our heads. The Vikings, giants with blonde hair and blue eyes, horned helmets, and axes swinging as longships cut through the fog. It's a powerful image. It's shaped everything from Hollywood epics to video games. But here's the catch. Almost none of that is real. The horned helmets, a 19th century invention. The idea of a single Viking look, more fantasy than fact. Viking wasn't an ethnicity. It wasn't even a tribe. It was a job description, a role you could take on. To go Viking meant to raid, trade, or explore. You didn't need to be born in Scandinavia to do it. This is where genetics begins to matter. For decades, scientists assumed Viking DNA was pure Scandinavian. That the same isolated stock of people produced the raiders who spread across Europe. But then came a revolution. Ancient DNA, or ADNA. Instead of guessing at origins, researchers started sequencing actual bones from Viking graves, found in Scandinavia, England, Ireland, Greenland, even as far as Ukraine. And the results? Shocking. Many Viking burials in England belonged to men with no Scandinavian ancestry at all. Some carried Southern European genes. Others, Eastern Steppe ancestry, stretching towards Central Asia. The Viking Age, roughly 750, 1050 CE, wasn't a story of one people expanding. It was the story of a network, a cultural identity that absorbed outsiders, traders, slaves, mercenaries, and transformed them into Vikings. At sites like Repton in England and Salme in Estonia, ship burials reveal crews of mixed ancestry. Some local men were buried with Viking weapons and rituals, showing they had been accepted into the Brotherhood. So, when we talk about Viking DNA, we're not talking about a single genetic profile. We're talking about a patchwork quilt, a mix of Scandinavians, Celts, Slavs, Balts, even people with deep roots in the Middle East. But this story doesn't begin with longships or raids. To understand why Viking DNA is so strange, we have to rewind further to the prehistoric migrations that shaped Scandinavia long before the word Viking even existed. Because the truth is, the people of the North were never pure. They were forged from wave after wave of outsiders, hunter-gatherers, farmers, step riders, each leaving their imprint in blood. And those ancient layers are still visible today. Long before the first Viking set sail, Scandinavia was already a genetic crossroads, its story doesn't begin in the Viking Age, but in the deep shadows after the Ice Age. Around 12,000 years ago, the glaciers pulled back, exposing a raw, empty landscape. The first humans who moved north were Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, descendants of Europe's earliest people. They were dark-skinned, blue-eyed, tough survivors who followed the herds into the thawing north. Later came the Neolithic farmers, arriving from the south and east. They brought something new, farming, herding, pottery, and also genes from the ancient Near East. These farmers mixed with the hunter-gatherers, layering new bloodlines into Scandinavia's foundation. Then, around 5,000 years ago, another wave arrived, steppe pastoralists from the vast grasslands north of the Black Sea ancestors of the Indo-Europeans swept in with horses, wagons, and new languages. They carried genes that would spread across Europe, all the way into the far north. By the Iron Age, the north was no genetic backwater. It was a mosaic, hunter-gatherer roots, farmer bloodlines, steppe ancestry, tangled together before the word Viking had even been spoken. Recent genetic studies of 297 ancient genomes across Scandinavia confirm this. They show that by the Viking Age, Scandinavia's gene pool was already layered with outside ancestry. Not just local mixing, but fresh inflows from Southern Europe, the Eastern Baltic, and even the British and Irish Isles. In fact, the Viking Age itself was the peak of this foreign ancestry. Before the Vikings, it was lower. After the Vikings, the gene pool shifted back closer to local Scandinavian roots, almost as if history briefly opened the floodgates, then closed them again. And that's the paradox. Modern Scandinavians actually carry less foreign ancestry than many Vikings did. 
The classic Scandinavian look we imagine today was in some ways less common during the Viking Age than it is now. Picture a 9th century traveler from the British Isles, maybe a captive taken in a raid, maybe a trader seeking silver, maybe even a monk. He settles in southern Sweden, he marries into a local family, his children carry genes from across the sea. In one generation, he is an outsider. In the next, his grandchildren are Vikings raiding the very islands their grandfather once came from. Genetic studies show this wasn't rare. British-Irish ancestry was widespread in Viking Scandinavia. Eastern Baltic ancestry concentrated in Sweden and Gotland. Southern European traces appeared in unexpected places. The Viking gene pool wasn't closed, it was wide open. And yet, as centuries passed, some of those outsider lineages disappeared. Others lingered, quietly, invisibly, waiting for modern science to rediscover them. So, by the time the Viking Age truly began around 750 CE, Scandinavia was not a pure land, but a genetic kaleidoscope primed to absorb even more new blood. And in the Viking centuries, that's exactly what happened. But what came in next is where the story gets stranger. The Viking Age, roughly 750 to 1050 CE, is usually told as a story of expansion. Raids on monasteries, voyages to Iceland, Greenland, even North America. But while Vikings pushed outward, something else was happening at home. A flood of new blood was pouring inward. The largest genetic survey to date, over 400 Viking era remains, shows that many Vikings weren't pure Scandinavians at all. A landmark study, Population Genomics of the Viking World, sequenced hundreds of burials across Europe, uncovering astonishing diversity. Earl, the results shattered the myth of the uniform Viking. Instead, Viking DNA looked like a storm pulling in fragments from Southern Europe, the British Isles, the Baltic, and even Central Asia. Some Viking burials, especially in Southern Scandinavia and far-flung settlements, carry unmistakable traces of Southern European and Mediterranean ancestry. In Foggia, Italy, Viking graves revealed men with Scandinavian Y DNA, but their overall genetic profile looked distinctly Italian. The explanation? Viking men marrying local women, blending two worlds in blood. The British Isles weren't just raided, they flowed into Scandinavia. Captured slaves, traders, missionaries, even willing migrants left their mark. Genetic evidence shows British and Irish ancestry became widespread in Viking Scandinavia. Some researchers argue that women from the British Isles may have had an outsized influence, shaping entire family lines in the north. Curiously, much of that influence faded in later centuries. Today, many modern Scandinavians actually carry less British-Irish ancestry than Vikings did. The Baltic Sea wasn't a barrier, it was a highway. Across its waters came genes from the eastern Baltic Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. This influence was strongest in central Sweden and Gotland regions deeply tied to Baltic trade. Much of it came through women, perhaps in marriages, alliances, or networks of exchange. Further north, Uralic ancestry seeped in, shaping the genetic divide we still see today between northern and southern Scandinavians. The Sami people with ancient Uralic roots left a lasting imprint. But here's the paradox. After the Viking Age, much of this foreign ancestry declined. The genetic storm settled, and Scandinavia's gene pool shifted back toward older local roots. Why? Maybe immigrant groups had fewer descendants. Maybe assimilation diluted their lineages. Or maybe social dynamics simply favored native bloodlines. Whatever the cause, the Viking melting pot was partly temporary. In Estonia, archaeologists uncovered a boat burial with four brothers killed together on an expedition. Their DNA? Scandinavian at the core, but laced with ancestry from beyond the north, a genetic echo of how wide the Viking network stretched. In Orkney, Scotland, burials with swords and shields revealed something startling. The men inside weren't Scandinavian at all. They were locals who had adopted Viking culture so fully that they were buried as Vikings, not by blood, but by belonging. 
By now you may be asking, how did so many outsiders get absorbed into the Viking world? What social rules allowed strangers to become brothers in arms? And which lineages survived into today? The answers lie in the next chapter of our story. By now, we know the Viking Age was genetically messy, but how did outsiders from Ireland, the Baltics, even the Mediterranean become part of Viking bloodlines? To answer that, we need to look at the mechanisms, the social and cultural processes that absorbed foreign genes into Scandinavia. Viking raids weren't just about treasure, they were also about people. Captives taken from the British Isles or the Baltic often ended up in Scandinavia. Genetic evidence shows that much of the non-local ancestry in Viking remains comes from women, revealed in mitochondrial DNA. This suggests a sex-biased gene flow. Foreign women brought home, integrated, and raising Viking children. Beyond raids, there were marriages of politics and opportunity. In England, Ireland, Normandy, and Rus, Vikings often married local women. Their children carried blended ancestry, but were raised within Viking culture. Some of these families even returned to Scandinavia, bringing British, Irish, or Slavic genes back into the homeland. Archaeology reveals burials with Viking weapons and ornaments, but DNA shows the individuals weren't Scandinavian at all. This proves that being a Viking was not strictly about blood. It was about behavior and culture. A Pict or Anglo-Saxon could fight and die as a Viking. The flow wasn't only outward. Traders, missionaries, nobles, and slaves also moved into Scandinavia. A study of 297 ancient genomes shows the Viking Age had the highest level of foreign inflow compared to earlier or later eras. Central Sweden and Gotland show strong Baltic and Uralic signals, while some Norwegian fjords remained almost untouched. Not all outsider genes lasted. Some lineages were diluted, others left no descendants. After the Viking Age, Scandinavia's gene pool shifted back toward a more local baseline. Genetic drift and demographic factors helped erase much of the Viking era diversity. Imagine a raiding ship returning to Norway with Irish captives. A young woman is absorbed into a household, raising children who grow up speaking Old Norse, fighting as Vikings. Generations later, her Irish roots are invisible, except in their DNA. So, the Viking Age was not just swords and sails, it was a vast experiment in human mixing. But here's the question. Which of those strange strands survived into modern Scandinavia? By the close of the Viking Age, Scandinavia was a crossroads of genes. But not every strand of foreign ancestry endured. Some lineages were absorbed into the mainstream, others faded, and a few carved lasting marks still visible in modern populations. This is the Viking legacy in our DNA. Modern Scandinavians carry less non-local ancestry than Viking-era individuals. This means that many immigrant lineages, British, Irish, Baltic, Southern European, were diluted over the centuries. Genetic drift and demographic filters slowly shifted the population back toward a local baseline. Some legacies did persist. The north-south genetic gradient in Scandinavia today is largely explained by Uralic ancestry especially visible in northern Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Certain maternal lineages, mtDNA, trace back to Viking-era Scandinavia and are still found in Britain, Scotland, and Iceland. Uh, in northern Scotland, the Orkney and Shetland Islands still bear a Norse genetic imprint. But it's not pure Viking. Studies show a complex blend. Pictish genes, Celtic genes, and Norse genes layered together. In coastal Britain, some Y-DNA lineages, like I1 and R1A, still mark Viking paternal ancestry. These are faint echoes of men who once crossed the seas in longships. So, the strangeness of Viking DNA is twofold. One, during the Viking Age, it was unexpectedly diverse, absorbing people from all over Europe and beyond. Two, over time, only select strands survived, shaping today's Scandinavia into a genetic landscape that looks more stable, yet still carries faint whispers of that storm. And that brings us back full circle. What do these patterns reveal about Viking identity? Were Vikings defined by blood or by culture? And what does their strange genetic story tell us about the blurred lines between belonging, ancestry, and identity? 
So, what makes Viking DNA so strange? It wasn't pure, it wasn't uniform, it was fluid, porous, cosmopolitan. A Viking genome might carry echoes from Ireland, the Baltics, even the Mediterranean, and yet, still be buried under a ship's prow as a Norse warrior. The Viking world was as much about adoption as it was about conquest. People didn't need Scandinavian blood to be Viking. They needed Viking identity, weapons, rituals, long ship journeys, and allegiance to a culture. Archaeogenetics proves this. Many individuals buried as Vikings weren't entirely Scandinavian. Some were locals absorbed into the Viking way of life. Many immigrant lineages integrated but didn't dominate. Their threads wove into Viking society, but not all survived the centuries. In fact, modern Scandinavians carried less foreign ancestry than Viking-era individuals. That decline tells us genetic memory is fragile. Lineages can vanish, leaving only faint whispers for us to detect today. Evidence suggests foreign women had an outsized genetic impact. Their mitochondrial DNA lingers in Viking burials across Europe, hinting at sex-biased migration. Women absorbed into Viking families, shaping the ancestry of future generations. These subtle maternal signals remind us that Viking blood was shaped as much in the household as on the battlefield. Viking DNA complicates the legend. The bloodlines of history aren't neat, straight lines. They're tangled webs of travel, mixing, identity, and survival. So, when you picture a Viking, don't imagine a pure Norseman. Imagine a man or woman whose ancestors stretched across seas and steppes, whose identity was forged by culture, and whose DNA still carries echoes from many lands. If you believe blood remembers what history forgets, stay curious, because more stories are waiting in our genes. If you enjoyed this expedition into the Viking genome, hit subscribe. Tell us in the comments, if you could discover one surprising ancestry in your own DNA, what would you hope it is? And share this story, because many people carry hidden legacies in their blood, just waiting to be uncovered.